Okay, so welcome back from the break for the last talk of the day before the panel discussion. And we're very happy to have Praha Mitra from Cambridge, who will tell us about shadows and soft exchange in celestial CFD. Stage is yours. All right, thank you, Andrea. And also uh, thank you to all the organizers for having me here and allowing me to talk about this uh, work. So what I'll talk about today is uh, a paper that came out today, actually or yesterday, depending on where you are. So I'm, uh, I'm interested to chat about this. Um, the overall theme of this paper and today's talk, I think is more in line with the talks that happened on Tuesday, but um, everything that I'll say is extremely motivated by symmetries and asymptotic symmetries. So it also perhaps fits into the theme of today. Uh, a lot of closely related work is, uh, I'm just going to list all the relevant authors uh, right now. Uh, and of course, there were some great talks by Kevin and Hernan at this con earlier at this conference, and perhaps we might see some of this in a talk by Magnia uh, at the discussion session tomorrow. And of course, everything I'm saying is built on a large literature of, of, of uh, on celestial on celestial amplitudes, and I I won't even bother writing down every single author. Uh -huh. Okay. So what my goal is for today is to write down an, a soft effective action that reproduces both soft exchange, so infrared divergences, and soft theorems in both gauge and gravitational theories. And I'll focus only on abelian theories. There's a lot of complications with non-abelian gauge theories that I don't really understand right now. Uh, but the particular generalization that I'm interested in is to go beyond four dimensions. That's really what I've been focused most of uh, what I've been doing in this field recently. So the first question you might immediately have is why should I bother going uh, to greater than four dimensions. And I think there's a good reason to actually ask this question. You know, it's clear that two dimensional celestial CFTs have extremely rich structure, a lot of extra symmetries you have in two dimensions. And uh, it's very clear that there's perhaps more chance of making progress if you study the two dimensional case because it's so, it's so, it's so special. But I'd argue that the same reason is in fact uh, a, a hindrance as well. Because it's so special, you, you might, some of the more generic features that you expect the celestial CFT to satisfy uh, is a bit hidden in two dimensions, but might become obvious when you strip off all of the special properties and then focus on more general features, which so we might be able to see those in, in higher dimensions. And another reason you might want to stay in four dimensions as well, especially in the context of what I'm gonna talk about today is we know in higher than four dimensions, there are no infrared divergences. So what am I even talking about when I, when I want to write down an action in higher than four dimensions? Uh, and indeed, that's a, very good, uh, that's, that's a very good point. So what I'll be doing today is I'll be considering theories in which I explicitly introduce an infrared cutoff. And then I'm going to talk about soft exchange in the presence of the cutoff. The cutoff will always be small, but finite. It will never be taken to zero. And so we'll write down a soft, uh, we'll write down an action that, that describes the soft exchange in the presence of this cutoff. And obviously we'll see as expected, when I take the cutoff to zero in four dimensions, the soft action becomes dominant and in higher dimensions, the soft action simply vanishes. So uh, IR, IR dynamics becomes trivial. And uh, how I'll be doing this is I'll essentially be, everything I'll say today will be guided strictly by symmetries. Andy, question? When you say um, cutoff, are you putting a cutoff on the Mellon transform or, 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 or just on loop amplitudes? Or is that not I'm, gonna, I'm gonna put a cutoff in, uh, in, in energy. So energy will be greater than a IR cutoff and all loop integrals will be integrated from mu to infinity. And that might correspond to something in Mellon space, but we haven't really understood what that cutoff means from the Mellon picture. Okay, so when you write CCFT, you're, you're not going to Mellon space? We're not going to go to Mellon space for uh, okay. pretty much anything I say. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'll be fixing the action using asymptotic symmetries. Of course, there was a wonderful talk by Kevin earlier where he worked out how to fix this, uh, this soft action using the variational principle uh, and trying to construct a boundary action such that, uh, you know, that we have a well-defined variational principle uh, for uh, for GR. Now that was good and easy to do in four dimensions, but it's very difficult to do in greater than four dimensions. As we have discussed earlier today, in odd dimensions, we don't even really understand the large R expansion, what type of log terms appear. 
And it's just much more complicated to do if I was trying to do it using asymptotic expansions. So I'm just gonna forget about all of those things and just focus on symmetries. And we'll see actually that that's enough. There's, uh, we don't really need anything else. Symmetries will uniquely fix everything for us. Okay. So let me now be, uh, be a bit more specific and explain exactly what I'm going to be doing. So we are going to introduce a, a IR cutoff in energy E, and I'm also going to introduce another scale lambda. And this scale separates out what I'm going to call soft, uh, soft modes. It could be soft photons, soft gravitons, soft gluons, whatever. And uh, particles with energy greater than lambda will be hard. And the goal will be to extract the uh, contribution of soft modes to any scattering amplitude. And we'll take mu and lambda to be very small compared to the typical energy scale of a scattering amplitude, but not zero. Uh, they'll be finite. Uh, so the basic idea is very simple. You start off with a hard scattering amplitude, which is given by a very simple path integral. You break up the fields phi into a soft part and a hard part, which are defined by these, these cutoffs that I just told you before. These operators OI that are appearing in here, these are just the creation annihilation operators that define the S matrix. These operators OI factorize as well into a soft piece and a hard piece. And then you just plug all of this in and we integrate over all the hard modes. So we just integrate over all the hard modes and you do a bunch of calculation, which I've highlighted here for you if you wanted to go through. But the essential idea, of course, at the end of the day that we see is that we have an amplitude at scale mu factorizes into a soft correlation function and a hard amplitude. And obviously this is very reminiscent of the fact that the amplitude itself factorizes. And here we have some effective soft action, and this is the action that I would like to derive. Now in this slide, I've assumed that all of these particles OI are hard. So we don't have external soft photons or external soft gravitons. So we can include them as well. So it's very easy to include soft photons. So if I include some additional external soft particles, we know that the amplitude in that case also factorizes and you get some extra factors sitting in front of here. These are the soft factors whose explicit forms I'll talk about in a bit. Uh, so in complete generality, what I need my soft action to satisfy is that this has to be satisfied. So I have a soft correlation function which involves these operators UI. These operators are coming from the factorization of the hard modes. It also involves a bunch of external soft particles. And I would like to construct a soft action such that when I evaluate the correlation function on the left-hand side, I extract precisely what we expect from scattering amplitudes. So soft factors and the IR divergent phase. So that's, uh, that's what I'm going to be doing. So let's just start. Um, so I'll, I'll start off with a review of just old results or, or results that you've probably seen a million times, but since I'm doing it in general D dimensions, and you know, I've noticed most of the talks in this conference were in four dimensions, so perhaps the D dimensional results may not necessarily be familiar to everyone, so I'll review that a bit. Uh, then we'll go straight ahead and construct the action, again, using only symmetries, and uh, this will by far be the longest section of my talk, uh, and then I'll just flash all the results for gravity as well. The method will be the same, and we'll conclude. Atul. Atul just a slightly philosophical question that, uh, do you expect the whole CCFT to be a Lagrangian CFT or do we like expect just some kind of a soft subsector of that to be describable by- I would expect only component? the soft subsector to be, to be described by a Lagrangian, honestly. I mean, you could probably go a bit beyond just the soft sector and I'm not sure how much far we can take this, this process of writing down an actual action. I don't expect it to be possible for the entire, I think, I think the correct way to go for the entire CCFT would be to sort of try to list out currents and operators and look at current algebras and representations of that. I think that's what we should be doing. Yeah, as in the C celestial OPE beyond the soft subsector, can you try to write an action that gives you that, uh, those OPE coefficients and stuff? I don't know. We haven't done mm -hmm. it, uh, but I would also not expect that it's possible. Fair enough. Okay. So uh, let's, uh, let's start with the review. So an S matrix depends on momenta. 
uh, which are in this case D plus two dimensions. So whenever I say the word bulk, I mean D plus two dimensions. And whenever I say boundary, the boundary is D dimensions. Uh, so, so S matrix is parameterized by a bunch of momenta. Uh, I'm gonna parameterize my momentum as given over here. You can check that with all of these parameterizations, P squared is precisely minus M squared. So these XA are the, uh, the D coordinates on the celestial sphere. So these X's parameterize the celestial sphere. Uh, we, this is not really going to play a big role in what I'm going to talk today, but I think this is an important issue that we need to really take care of if you properly want to understand the structure of CCFTs. Uh, so we are, we are going to have to di differentiate between in and outgoing momenta, which we'll simply do by the sign of this, this omega factor sitting over here. Uh, we'll be talking about photons and gravitons. So photons have depolarizations in D dimensions, so in D plus two dimensions, they're vectors of SOD, which is the little group. And these are the depolarizations given here. So a polarization vector is labeled by, well, it has a vector index and it has a polarization index A, which goes from one to D. And the graviton is similarly, graviton transforms with a symmetric traceless representation. So it's simply constructed by a symmetric traceless product of the polarizations. All right. And I'm just, uh, the operators O that I alluded to earlier, here's the precise definition of what these operators are. When omega is positive, they simply insert some outgoing particle. And when omega is negative, it's going to insert the CPT conjugate ingoing particle. Okay, so with all of this out of the way, these are just some, some definitions. It's basically clear that we can write down the amplitude as uh, this sort of correlation function. Now at this point, this is a very trivial rewriting and I, I really don't think I have to motivate why this is a good thing at this conference. But what we know is that up to a Mellon transform, this, is, this, this S matrix is pre precisely that of a endpoint correlation function in some Euclid Euclidean D-dimensional conformal field theory. Uh, so we are not going to work in the Mellon basis in this talk at all, but I do want to flash the formula because the only part of this formula that I think that would be relevant is this particular uh, factor over here. This K delta is simply the ADS bulk to boundary propagator. And basically it's telling us that the, it's the bulk to boundary propagator that gives us, that relates uh, a, a momentum space uh, operator to a Mellon space operator. Uh, and I just want to, want to flash this because this function will be appearing a lot in our, in our talk. But, uh, but I'm, gonna I'm gonna emphasize this again, no nothing we'll do is going to be in Mellon space, even though all the results we have can easily be transformed into Mellon space by doing the appropriate transform. And the deltas of course are, are on the principal series axis for this transformation to be invertible. Uh, okay, let's also uh, quickly review the soft photon theorem. Th this is a very simple statement. You, you have on the left-hand side, uh, an amplitude with the insertion of a soft photon S and it factorizes into a soft factor. And the soft factor is given by, by this equation, which takes a very nice and simple form. If I rewrite everything in terms of the momentum parameterization that I presented earlier. Uh, this S has a precise definition in terms of the O operators that I've defined. Uh, one thing that I wanted to be, uh, this will come up later, so I want to be clear about is that, notice that there's a subscript, firstly, notice that there's a subscript mu over here which tells us that strictly in four dimensions, this is just a formal statement because of course, both sides of these equations are IR divergent. But we also know that they're IR divergent in the same way. So the IR factor actually cancels out between them. We also have another subscript, which is C equal to zero. And this C is the gauge connection at infinity. And the fact that it's zero is basically telling us it's the connection with respect to which we measure electric charges. This is something that's a, basically implicitly assumed everywhere in, in in basically in, in all of scattering uh, theory, but it's important here because it'll come up later. By what I mean by this is that if, if I tell you, for instance, that the electron has charge minus one at the North Pole, and I ask you to figure out what, the, what its charge is at the South Pole, what you need to do is you need to parallel transport. And the fact that this gauge connection is trivial is simply telling us that the parallel transport is trivial. In other words, the electron has charge minus one anywhere on the sphere, which is of course a convention that we use. Uh, so that's what this C equal to zero uh, subscript implies. Indeed, in a, when you work in a different vacuum where C is not equal to zero, uh, and so we have a non-trivial connection, then the electric charge will depend on which, which point on the sphere I'm sitting in. 
Okay. Uh, and we also know, yes, Andy. Does the electric charge depend on the point in the sphere or the, or the phase of the state? The phase of the state, but that electric charge is defined by how the, how the state transforms under a global U1 transformation. And so that transformation depends on uh, that, that phase will be picked up and it'll precisely modify your definition of the charge. This is not that big of an issue in abelian theories, but it will, it's a very big issue in non-abelian theories. Okay, uh, it's also well established that these award identities of asymptotic symmetries. So in particular, we can construct charges, we can construct uh, currents, conserved currents uh, that generate the uh, associated U1 symmetry. And here's the first place the shadow transform shows up and it'll show up a lot in this talk. So let me just define what it is here. So the current JA, the U1 current that generates uh, uh, the U1 symmetry of this theory, is precisely given by the shadow transform of the soft operator. And this is the definition of the shadow transform in, in, in general dimensions. This I that's appearing over here is this conformally covariant tensor. R is simply the representation of SOD under which this operator O transforms. And the shadow transform of course has a nice property that it squares to the identity up to a proportionality constant. And this proportionality constant, when the representation is a spin S representation, takes this exact form. And it's exactly C one comma one that's appearing in this equation over here. So you might notice that when I said delta equal to one, because of this delta minus one factor explicitly, things go to zero. So what, you're, what you actually are supposed to do with this equation is that you're supposed to evaluate the shadow transform for arbitrary delta and then take the delta goes to one, which gives you something that's perfectly finite. Uh, and you can then see that if I work out what the current ward identity is, uh, by the way, maybe I should make a comment, one comment here. Uh, we know that in four dimensions, this relationship is local. We know that in four dimensions, the current is simply given by the soft factor. So what's happening there? And this is exactly one of the reasons why 4D is special and some of the structure gets obscured. What happens is that the shadow transform for in four dimensions, well, in two celestial, uh, in, two, in D equal to two, uh, for a vector field, which is exact, happens to localize. So it, the shadow transform is a completely local transform in two dimensions for a very specific, when delta is specifically equal to one, which is why we see in two dimensions, there is a local relationship between the current and S, uh, but we actually the, the more general relationship is that of a shadow transform. There's another reason to guess that it had to be the case. The dimension of S is one, whereas the dimension of a current has to be D minus one because it's a conserved current. And so you could just guess that it had to be a shadow transform. Turns out it is. So the current ward identity, you can work it out. And we see that this, this precise bulk to boundary propagator appears here again. And what this is telling us is that for at least for massive particles, massive particles are not localized on the celestial sphere. They carry a, a non-local charge distribution, which is precisely governed by the bulk to boundary propagator. And in the massless limit, when I take this argument, the first argument to zero, we have a precisely local distribution because of uh, this famous property of, bulk of ABS uh, propagators. So uh, massless particles are nice and local on the celestial sphere. Massive particles are not, should not be surprising to anyone here. Okay. Uh, yes, Andy? But, ma but massless particles, massive particles can be put in wave functions that are localized on the celestial sphere. No, You're so if you, if you, those. this is actually one of the, if you now try to go to melon basis. You wouldn't go to a melon basis. You have to do a, you have to do a, Bulk convoluted with the bulk to boundary propagator on the uh, momentum hyperbola. Right, right. You would have to do this generalized Mellon transform that I described here. Right? Right. And indeed, you don't get a localized distribution even there. So that, that's what I was trying to say. I, I don't think even the O deltas that you define are actually, in, for massive particles definitely, are actually even localized in that case. So the, the we check the Klein Gordon current yes. is delta function on the celestial sphere, right? Yeah, I think the I think the thing that we don't yet understand, and I think uh, uh, Sebastian referred to this yesterday, is that there are two possible ways to do this uh, sort of the transformation: is to either take the one that I showed there, or to do a, a shadow transform of that. And I'm not really sure what's the right answer. Well, they're the same for massive particles that. No, as I, as, 
The shadow just okay. edges delta. Right. So then you would you would you would have to agree with me that the that Mellon basis operator can't possibly have a localized charge distribution for all delta. Because if I do a shadow transformation, that simply gives me the same operator with dimension D minus delta, and that definitely will not have a local distribution. So somehow we have to restrict that. I, think I don't agree with that. I, I, I think that um, the shadow does nothing. It just changes delta. So, but but it would change the charge distribution that I that I have to that I have here. If if a, if, a, if the, a local operator, sorry, isn't the Klein Gordon charge current a delta function? If you compute it for this wave function, isn't it a delta function on the celestial sphere? Doesn't that depend on whether you restrict to the positive or the full uh, real line for yeah, the yeah? That's I think that is part? because if you don't restrict it, then you have the power law on the delta function piece, right? And Not this is related to the current. comment about Wait, that. If you want to restrict it, huh? If you restrict it to either the positive or the negative, uh, if you have two massive wave functions where delta oh, is- Oh, yeah, two massive curve. wave functions, the inner product of them, of course, will contain one over Z minus W, but just one wave function, phi star d mu phi, the Klein-Gordon left-right arrow, the Klein-Gordon current, um, that, which represents the charge distribution, I, I, I believe is a delta function on the celestial sphere. Okay, that may be the case. I don't understand that enough to, to really comment on it. It's puzzling, but I'm pretty sure it's true. Okay. Monica? Yeah, can I add a comment on that? Yeah. I don't actually think that that's the relevant thing for whether they're local or not. I think what's relevant is if you put the modes, like the A and A daggers in the conformal primary basis, and you can compute their commutator. And if that commutator is a delta function, then they act locally. And if they're not, which I think is the case for massive particles, then they're non-local. And the reason why that's the relevant thing is that if you, you know, for example, construct the electromagnetic current out of like A dagger A, and then act on a state, which is created by an A dagger, if those, if that commutation relation doesn't involve a delta function in Z, then it's gonna act non-locally. Well, that's kind of a funny definition. First of all, that's what Andrea was saying when you have two things. And so then wouldn't we, I mean, we're okay with one over Z minus Ws on the celestial sphere. We wouldn't call that non-local from, I'm not sure what, what, what exactly you mean by local or non-local. You're saying the two-point function has a one over Z minus W for, for two different modes. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, That's I'm good. saying it, I'm we saying don't want it, just the contact terms, right? No, but but the property, like the the property in four D for massless particles in the Mellon basis that gave rise to them acting like local operators that they look like singular when you bring them together, you can trace back to the fact that when you basically that Mellon transforms don't touch the Z dependence. So that if you bring, you know, a massless photon close to, yeah, like a, okay, sorry, I don't want to derail for our stock. I should, yeah. we should leave this for, yeah. We can discuss this in the discussion session. I think it's very important. I think it's an important question to add, an interesting question to, to find an answer to. Okay, uh, so another thing we also know is about uh, infrared uh, divergences. Well, I should call them soft exchange because they're not really divergences in higher dimensions. Uh, and so we know that the, uh, the amplitude factorizes and it precisely factorizes into, into this form where gamma is given by this integral. This is a standard exercise in QFT. And also it's a standard exercise to actually evaluate this integral, uh, which I will not do, but I will recast it into a nice form that will be useful for, for us. And the, and the form is simply given like this. So gamma has a real part and an imaginary part Alpha is the, roughly the effective fine structure constant at, at the scale mu. And so because of this D minus three factor, we see that it diverges as you remove the cutoff in four dimensions, but it's, it goes to zero in higher dimensions. And then the real part of this is simply given by an integral of the soft factor squared. So this J that was appearing here is the exact same factor that that's appearing over here, J, it's a soft factor precisely. 
Again, perhaps not that surprising. I'll very briefly, but in lieu of time, not really say much. This gamma also has an imaginary term. And I think this is never discussed, but I think it's a very important term to really discuss if you want to study properties like unitarity or crossing symmetry, because uh, this just has a very complicated structure. And if I have time, I have an extra slide, which I might talk about uh, this phase in a bit. Okay, so let's just summarize the review. So in QED, in, in abelian gauge theory, this is what we have to prove now. We have to find a soft action, action such that this particular correlation function on, on the left-hand side reproduces exactly this result on the right-hand side with these definitions written out here. And uh, I, when I meant to say that, I, I, I won't talk about the phase anymore uh, because we actually don't yet know if there is a soft action which can reproduce this A2. So I'm just gonna drop it and forget it for now, but I do think it's not really the right thing to do. Uh, okay, so let's just talk about the boundary action. Now. So what I'm going to try and do is work out as much as possible the action using symmetries. So what are the symmetries in question? Of course, we know, uh, firstly, the first question is what are the soft modes? So what is the action of function of? Uh, in, in QED, there are exactly two soft modes that we have to consider. Uh, there might be more if you're interested in the subleading soft photon theorem, there are potentially more, but I'm only gonna focus on the leading soft theorem. So there's only two soft modes that we're interested in. The first one is this S that I've already introduced, which is the soft photon mode. And the other one is the edge mode, which is the connection at infinity. C. So in, in other words, we need to find an action which is a function of S and C. Those are all the soft modes in my theory. I'm gonna first simplify by considering amplitudes which have no insertions of S. So just a hard amplitude. And in that case, I can integrate out S and I can obtain an effective action for just the edge mode. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna first find this action for just the edge mode and then I'm going to integrate back in my soft mode once I've done that. And so I'm gonna construct this using symmetries. So let's do that. So the symmetries in our case are precisely large gauge transformations, which are generated by a function epsilon, which does not vanish on the boundary of scry. And there's an order parameter for the symmetry, which is the Wilson line, which transforms precisely like this. X naught is an arbitrary base point. It doesn't really matter. You can choose it. it you can choose it to be the North pole or whatever. So, in the quantum theory, the expectation value of W is one, because as I just discussed, we assume that C is equal to zero when you evaluate S matrix elements. So at least in the perturbative S matrix element, the expectation of, of W is one, which is obviously not equal to zero, which tells us that these large gauge symmetries are spontaneously broken. And they're broken down to the global U1 symmetries, the symmetries for which this difference is exactly equal to zero for every choice of epsilon. So we have, a, we have a, a system in which we have spontaneously broken large gauge symmetries broken down to global symmetries. And there's a Goldstone mode for this. And the Goldstone mode is the mode which realizes the full symmetry non-linearly, and that's just this field C. So in other words, C is just the Goldstone mode. And so we know, I'm just gonna use standard effective field theory techniques when we, when we see spontaneous symmetry breaking. The goal will be to write down some action where this not symmetry is realized non-linearly. So it's almost obvious to write down the action really, because we know it has to be invariant under C goes to C plus D epsilon. Really, it can only be a function of F, which is DC. However, we also know in the absence of magnetic charges, which is an assumption I'm going to make uh, in this talk, but we have explored it in the paper, uh, F is equal to zero. The field strength uh, vanishes at infinity because there are no magnetic charges. So indeed, there's absolutely no action that we can write down. Uh, so you might say, well, job done. We have nothing to write down. Uh, let's just go home. But indeed, the, the complication arises. This is only true in the absence of an IR regulator. And remember, we are introducing an infrared regulator and discussing everything in the presence of that regulator. So what happens when I introduce an infrared regulator? In that case, these large gate symmetries are explicitly broken. You can think of, for instance, one of possible regulators giving the photon a mass. The moment the photon gains a mass, you no longer have gauge symmetries and you no longer have any of these large gauge symmetries. So the moment you introduce an IR regulator in one form or the on another, these large gauge symmetries are also explicitly broken. And therefore following the usual methods of dealing with such things, we, we should also include in our action terms which explicitly break the symmetry, the large gauge symmetry, not the global, not the global UI symmetry. And again, the simplest possible thing we can hope to write down is just a mass term. 
for this C. Now, we've already made one in implicit assumption in writing down this action, and we have assumed locality. Now, this is okay to do in standard effective field theory because we are trying to write down a d-dimensional action that reproduces d-dimensional physics. But that's not what we are trying to do here. We are trying to write down a d-dimensional action that reproduces d plus two-dimensional long wavelength physics, so long distance physics. And so given the d plus two dimensional physics is very long distance, in fact, there is no reason to expect that the bulk theory has to be local. So we should relax that assumption and then consider a more general action, which is non-local. And indeed we'll see, we have to do that. Local actions will not give us the right answer. So this is the action that, that I'm going to assume based on all of these principles that I've argued in this uh, slide. Okay, uh, I'm almost done. I've basically given you the, the action. The only other thing I need to tell you now is what are the operators UI? Remember, that's what I have to compute the correlation functions of. So I need to tell you what that is. That's also very easy to work out. Uh, let me just, sorry, rem remind you because C is flat because I've said F is equal to zero. So you can write C is, is D theta. So this theta will just show up right now. So how do I figure out what this UI has to be? Again, we can focus, we can do it using symmetries. How do we do that? We just look at how these operators OIs transform. Now these were done in multiple ways, uh, but I'm just gonna motivate it very simply here. Remember this KD was also appearing in the, in the ward identity for the current. So the ward identity for the current is tells us the exact charge con configuration, the charge distribution that the operator has to satisfy. And so that same charge distribution appears in its gauge transformation. If you're not happy with this, there's a way to derive this explicitly. This was derived by Alok and Miguel in their papers where they discussed the massive soft photon theorem. It's also in Monica's uh, and Andy and uh, the other authors uh, in that paper where of course they worked it out in four dimensions, but this is the higher degeneralization of, of that statement. And uh, again, it localizes for massless particles exactly as expected. So can we use this to construct what this operator U is? almost very, very easily. We just look at how theta transforms under the same symmetry. We know theta goes to theta plus epsilon. So a naive and a very natural guess is to just take the same operator, this exact term over here, but you replace epsilon with theta. And now if I choose this as my definition for UI, I'm going to have the correct symmetry transformation for the operator O. So that's it. So again, using symmetry arguments, I'm gonna choose this to be my operator U. Uh, uh, one thing to note is that I can write this operator. So now what I need to compute is I need to compute the product of all of these U's. So when I take the product, I get a sum over all I's and then I can write it in a very interesting way. What I would like to do, because it's, it's a nice thing to write it in terms of, I would like to write the action in terms of C, not in terms of theta. So I, I want to invert this relationship. I want to invert theta and in terms of C. So I can do that. The only issue is that theta might have a zero mode, which I need to set. I separate out the zero mode over here. You can perform the integral and you precisely get sum over charges. And then the, all the other non-zero modes you can write in terms of, uh, uh, you can write out in terms of C. C appears right over here. And then I've defined this uh, current, which is just a shadow transform of the soft factor. And you can check by explicit calculation that the divergence of this current is precisely this charge distribution. So that's how these two are related. Uh, the only thing I, I had to extract are the zero mode. So, uh, so hard, I think- you have five minutes left. Good. So we have everything. Let's just evaluate the path integral. It's, it's, it's basically done. So here's the full path integral that I need to evolve, uh, that I need to evaluate. That's the action. Uh, this is all the interaction terms, and then there's a zero mode. So the integral over the zero mode, remember here the zero mode is compact because theta lives on S1. It's a U1 gauge theory. So you get a Kronecker delta function in the charges. So this is charge conservation. And then the remaining path, this is just a simple Gaussian path integral. There's nothing fancy about this. So you can just evaluate it. And we find this P, which is the inverse matrix of, of P inverse defined over here. So that's, this is the best thing we can say with symmetries. We have gone as far as we can with symmetries. And now we simply match. Remember our goal was to say that the, this correlation function should reproduce for us soft exchange amplitudes, so the infrared divergences. 
And so for that all to work, we need this exact factor that's sitting in the exponential to be precisely that factor that a gamma that was appearing in, in infrared divergences. And indeed, this completely fixes the propagator. I'll just tell you what, what it is right here, horribly non-local. Here's the action. So here's my claim for what the action looks like, which reproduces the infrared divergences. But I think here's the kicker, and uh, which I was trying to, here's the kicker. It looks horribly non-local, but if I write everything in terms of the shadow modes, perfectly local. For, certainly I was not expecting this. I don't really understand at all where this comes from, but this gives us a hint that the shadow modes are local from the boundary point of view. I don't know what else to say about this, but I think this is an interesting thing, thing to perhaps explore. And indeed the interaction action, which is the product of these UIs can also be written locally in terms of the shadow mode. And the, the thing that couples to the shadow mode is precisely the soft factor. So there we have it, we have constructed the action. Uh, we're not completely done because remember this was the effective action once we integrated out S. So we have to sort of integrate S back in and I'm, not, I'm just gonna tell you what the action is. Here's, here's what the action looks like uh, when you integrate back S in. Andy, I'll, I'll be finished in two minutes. If you just let, give me that much time, then uh, if that's okay. Um, so this is the full soft action, which, and you can now go through the calculation, which we won't go through, but it reproduces exactly this, I, this IR phase and it reproduces precisely the soft factors as well as expected. So let me just make some comments. The action is local in terms of the shadow mode. Make of that what you will. I don't fully understand this myself. Uh, in D greater than four, remember alpha goes to zero when the cutoff is removed. So this entire first term vanishes completely. And so we just have a very trivial coupling between S and C tilde. And indeed this, is ex this, this term precisely reproduces all the tree level uh, commutators that are derived from covariant phase space. So I, I I feel that this is also a good action to use if you want to try and understand the quantum corrected commutators uh, without doing covariant phase space because covariant phase space requires trying to understand the space time properties of these fields, which is just very difficult to understand. Uh, and d equal to four alpha goes to infinity. So this term becomes dominant as we, this, is a, this gives a rise to IR divergences. And I, as I was mentioning here, so the, what happens specifically in four dimensions and if the shadow, if a C is an exact form, but it on, only works if it's an exact form, is that the shadow transform is perfectly local. And this is the reason if you read all of the other papers I mentioned in the beginning part of my slide, uh, all of them did analysis in four dimensions. So their actions were all local, but that's a special feature of four dimensions, not, not a generic feature. Okay, and I'm just gonna flash the equations for gravity as well. Let me not bother with all of this. I'll just tell you what the action is. Here's the action for gravity. Works out, it gives us all the soft, uh, all the soft theorems. Uh, it gives us all the uh, gravitational uh, uh, identities as well. And we precisely also find if you work out UI to UN, you extract out the zero mode, you extract precisely the momentum conservation. In this case, because we don't have a compact group, we have a direct delta function, which gives us momentum conservation. And then or the rest of the amplitude simply gives us all the infrared divergences. So let me now just conclude. Uh, we've derived an effective action and it's local in terms of the shadow mode. And it's with something to uh, perhaps suggests, I, I wouldn't want to conjecture anything that's strong, but it perhaps suggests that maybe the shadow modes are what we should be looking at in terms of local operators in the, in the boundary theory. Uh, there are three problems I think, uh, which are personally interesting to me and which we have not yet addressed is firstly, how does the imaginary part of gamma fit into the story? I actually do have a guess for the action, but I have no symmetry interpretation of that. I can just write it down in the sense that it's something that gives us the right answer, but I, have, I don't understand why that's correct. Uh, now we can try to generalize this to non-abelian theories as well. And now we see that even in two, even in four dimensions, the action is non-local because it's a shadow transform, but the, the C is no longer, it's not an exact form anymore. So the, the conjecture if, if of, maybe I can conjecture this at least, is that if you want to reproduce 
four dimensional non abelian infrared divergences, you have to work with this non local action. Uh, so that's actually interesting. So, of course, this makes the entire analysis exceptionally more complicated, but you know, non abelian IR divergences are also very complicated. So, this would be an interesting thing to see if it works. And there are, of course, other soft modes which we haven't discussed super rotations. There's the subleading soft graviton theorem. So, it would be nice. I think this, this sort of general analysis would allow us to also write down actions to, for these modes as well. All right, I'll stop here. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks a lot, Prahar. Um, so we are uh, already at the time where it's the, the panel discussion would start. So we'd suggest that uh, if there is a quick question now um, that we can take it and otherwise um, come back to more questions in the extended discussion session. Anan? Yes. So, sorry, I, I want to ask you about the gluon case, the just the, the last action you you put there. Um, the thing is, in your derivation for QED, you only consider dipole interactions. But in the gluon case, it's known that there will be more corrections. So do you know this action will change? If this action will change in presence of those other corrections? Uh, I haven't honestly done any sort of real analysis to be, to be able to make any concrete statement. As I said, this action was written down using purely symmetry arguments. So I haven't used anything more than symmetry to write this down. Now there could be, there will definitely be because C tilde is now a non-local function. So you will now have interactions between non-local interactions in this action between different particles. And so maybe this non-local type of interactions are the type of things that we will give rise to the non, you know, the non-dipole types of terms that you get in the interaction in, in, in non-abelian gates. That is kind of my hope because, because you you sort of inherently have an non, you inherently have non-locality in the d-dimensional action as well, which will therefore correspond to non-locality in momentum space. So you have all sorts of, but I, again, I have not really done proper analysis to, this is a, this is just a, it's the reason it's in an open question problem. This is just a guess for what it could be. Yeah. Sorry, I don't have a great answer. Thanks, anyways. Okay, great. Um, Andy, you had a question during the talk. Do you want to pose it now or wait till later? Okay, good. Then uh, I suggest we thank Prahar again and come back to more questions uh, in the discussion session and start the panel discussion now. And uh, I suggest that we go in alphabetical order unless uh, there are other requests. So I would ask uh, Glenn to, to share his screen.